afternoon, everybody. I am glad to have all of you here for our third in this series of the Trauma-Informed Care Wednesday webinar series. Our topic today is Trauma-Causing Life Events, Vicarious Trauma, and Resident Responses Caused by Trauma Triggers, and our presenter will be Ed Hoppel. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and has been approved for CEUs. I'll get those certificates to you uh, within the next week. The recording to watch for CEUs will also be available one day next week, and I will send that out as well. The email that comes out with the recording and your certificates will have the PowerPoint and two handouts that Ed is going to share today. You do not have video or audio access because it's in a webinar format, so you may ask questions in chat. Ed will also be doing a couple of polls that you'll be able to answer in chat as well. Um, again, the webinar is approved for CEs. You'll each receive your certificate of attendance. I said that already. At the end, when I sign off, when I say we're done and sign off, the evaluation link will pop up. So if you can complete that for us, that would be great. We're glad you're here today. And now, Suzanne, if you would like to introduce Ed, I will stop sharing my screen. Absolutely. It's my pleasure to introduce Ed Hoppel this afternoon. Um, in his past uh, 30 years working in the human services field, uh, advocacy has always been at the forefront of Ed's career. And for the past 12 and a half years, we've been really fortunate as the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program to have Ed working with us. Uh, he covers five counties in North Central West Virginia. And he advocates for residents and their rights in nursing homes, assisted living, and legally unlicensed homes. He's been a guest presenter at the West Virginia Activity Professionals Conferences, the West Virginia Dietary Professionals Conference, and is co-presented as part of the West Virginia Elder Abuse Awareness Day educational event. And he often provides various trainings at facilities in his region. He's an active member of the West Virginia Behavioral Health Planning Council's Adult Services Committee, a community coalition member with Quality Insights and a former, former advisory council member for the North Central Aging and Disability Resource Center. Ed is a graduate of West Virginia University with a BA Board of Regents degree with a focus on gerontology and special education. He lives in rural Marion County with his wife, Shelly, their dog, Zeus, and their cat, Nefret. And without further ado, welcome, Ed, and thanks for uh, sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. Sure, thank you. Um, so this is the first time I've ever presented on Zoom, so there may be a learning curve here for me. So let me see. Uh, let me see if this will let me do it. Okay, so uh, today's presentation, we're going to be talking about trauma causing uh, life events, uh, vicarious trauma, and residence responses um, caused by trauma. Um, and what we're going to be doing is, um, before we kind of dive into that, uh, one thing, one area that I have found that we haven't covered yet, really, is what is a trigger? And so the, the very first part of this is we're gonna be talking about uh, triggers, um, what they are and go from there. As a warning, I wanted to let everyone know that included with this presentation, um, there may be some photos that may be triggers for some of the viewers. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that um, before we kind of delve into um, our topic. Um, So the very first thing I'm going to ask of you guys is to put in the chat uh, which of the following six photographs um, could be triggers for our residents. Um, so if you could just put the numbers in the chat and I'll put the pictures up here in just a second. And then if Suzanne or Susan can let me know your responses. And I have numbered one through six. Getting one, three, a lot of alls. 
A lot of alls. Three. Okay. Three, four, and six. Okay. Um, and the correct answer, if there is a correct answer, literally could be all of them. Um, three, four, five, and six are kind of obvious. Um, three being a fire with firemen, uh, four being a wildfire, five being a tornado, and six being a volcano erupting. Um, and depending on our, our residents, they may have experienced some of those or all of those. Um, one and two are also triggers. And number two, I'm not gonna talk about a lot right now. We're gonna be covering that in a few slides later. But number one, I wanted to talk, talk a little bit about this one because at first glance, it doesn't seem threatening. It doesn't seem an issue per se. They're all smiling. For the most part, they're all fairly relaxed standing there. Um, but number one could be a trigger for some of our residents, especially if all six of these individuals show up in a residence room at the same time. Um, so it could be that. It could be the fact that um, the way they're standing, um, two of them have their arms crossed, which is not a really good stance to take if you're gonna be talking with somebody, especially if we know that they're gonna be sensitive to, to those types of body languages. Um, the woman on the far left is probably the most casual person standing there. And that's probably the stance I would take. Um, very casual, very relaxed stance. Um, and of course, going in with six people, you know, you're just ramping up the difficulty there and working with individuals. So usually one or two, sometimes even two individuals can, can be triggering for an individual. Um, like I said, the arms crossed kind of gives the message um, that, you know, even though they're smiling, that maybe they're there to quote, unquote, deal with somebody. Um, something else I want to point out, and I'm going to ask you is what else can you see from that number one picture of something that maybe they should do differently? And if you want to put your answers in the chat, and there's one thing in particular I'm looking for. Their body language? Body language is one thing, but there's one other thing. It's not really, it doesn't necessarily have to do with triggers though, but it's just one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, they are blocking too many people, uncross their arms. The amount of people could be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. White coat. There's yeah. no exit. There's no exit for the person they are talking to. The hall's blocked. They're spread out, blocking the exit. Mm -hmm. Overwhelming in stance and number. Mm -hmm. How about the location of their name tag? Of the net ones that you can see that have name tags on, they all have them at the bottom of their shirts. And while you know. It may seem like a good idea to have them down that low, especially when you're working with someone who may be in a wheelchair or in a bed. Um, that's not a normal place for someone to look for a name tag. And oftentimes when they're at, at that level, they're actually blocked and they're unreadable. And it's always a good idea for you to, to identify yourself both verbally. And if you have a name tag, make sure it's vis visible and easy to read. So that would be the one other thing that I would kind of really truly point out with that group that maybe um, they could change that as well. And that may make them more welcoming and more um, less likely to get a response. Again, though, the number of people is just, it's a lot. It really and truly is. And so now, and before, yeah. before you move on, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm I'm seeing your view of the, of the slides rather than the, the, the slideshow. With, uh, oh. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. Susan, technical help. I'm looking. Look on your your uh, icons below, below the screen. Is there one that is a full screen one? Yeah, right in there is one of those that'll take you to full screen. 
black and blue. Bottom. Black or on black slideshow. See all slides. Hi, see it. Yeah, high presenter view. Yeah, because on on my screen, so I have a monitor set up with this, so I'm actually seeing. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Thanks, Suzanne. I had caught that yet. I was doing something else. And I couldn't tell. <laughs> um, so my next question for y'all, now that I lost my preview, I'm, I'm going to have to do this from memory. Um, are all triggers visual, yes or no? And if you could put that in the chat. Lots of no's. Good. Yeah. And someone Triggers also are... said sounds and smells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, anything that involves your five senses, anything that can bring back a memory of a trauma could trigger a trigger or could trigger a trigger a response. Um, those of you that are in my facilities, if you've heard me talk at any of my trainings, you You'll probably be familiar with this story. Um, for me, um, the smell of sauerkraut is a trigger. And you're probably thinking, how can the smell of sauerkraut be a trigger? Well, for me, when I was about eight years old, I got severe food poisoning when, when New Year's Eve from sauerkraut. And so to this day, the smell of sauerkraut, I immediately start getting ill. Um, so for me, the smell of sauerkraut is definitely a trigger. Um, so any facility that's having sauerkraut, when I get there, I'll probably walk in and turn around and walk back out again because it's not a pleasant experience. Um, you know, if that happened to me now, you know, if, if I hadn't had that experience and had that experience now with sauerkraut, it probably won't be a trigger per se because being, you know, getting food poisoning, you know, isn't, it's a big deal, but it's not necessarily traumatic. But for a child of eight years old who had food poisoning, it was pretty traumatic. So, um, so basically, why are trigger triggers? Because they bring back memories of past trauma. I um, mean, they can be anything that elicits that memory. So, seeing an event, a photo, movie, commercial, etc., um, smelling a smell, like I just said, uh, hearing a sound or a noise or even a phrase could be a trigger tasting something. So if I had to taste sauerkraut with a blindfold on, that would be a trigger for me. And physical touch, whether it's the location of the touch or the item that is touched or the texture of the item that's touched, all those really could be um, potential um, triggering events. Um, so basically anything that will bring back that past memory um, and whatnot. And I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we're talking about um, triggers as we go through this too. Um, some triggers we think are obvious, but they're not and vice versa. And so we're going to be talking about that just a little bit more here in a minute um, of how that can be really um, cause issues. Are all traumas equal to different individuals? Well, the answer is no. Um, trauma is the trauma itself is person centered in that, you know, different people view and react to trauma events differently. Uh, what might be traumatic for one person may not be traumatic for the next. And however, groups of people can experience group trauma. Um, an example I can, I can give that kind of touches on all these bases is um, the 9-11 attacks that happened. Um, for the people that experienced it firsthand, yes, that was traumatic, I'm sure. Um, and also there was groups of people that were together, that experienced it together, ones that were actually in, in Manhattan at the time, or actually out in the street at the time. Um, but someone viewing on, on television, while well, it could be traumatic and they could have received triggers from that event, it may not happen for everybody. You know, we can show empathy and, and empathize with what happened and concern for what happened, but it may not be a trauma event for us per se. Um, I'm not saying it hasn't, and it, it, there's also been a study done where group trauma um, in that event happened just with the newscast. So really, trauma is individual to that person and the person who's experiencing that trauma firsthand or 
secondhand for that matter, through news stories and, and whatnot. Um, and that's also a good example too, because if you were traumatized by such an event, as you all remember, the news story um, of that happening was covered for weeks on end afterwards. And that was re-traumatizing re people as well. Granted, the news stories needed to happen, but unfortunately the people that experience trauma from that sometimes are forced to re-experience that trauma over and over again um, in such a manner. So being aware of those types of situations um, is really important. Um, Another thing we need, need to think about as well is um, any of our biases that we may have about a traumatic event. And what I mean by that um, is because an event may be tra traumatic for some and not for others, we may inadvertently overlook, overlook a traumatic event based on our personal biases or the biases of the person who didn't experience the trauma, such as a resident's family member. So if we're talking to, to a resident's family about the trauma that this resident may or may not have experienced, they may overlook, you know, a fire that occurred across the street from them and didn't involve actually the, the individual per se. Um, and a good example of that, we actually had a resident um, who was very traumatized by um, alarms and uh, the sound of sirens and stuff. And as it turned out, um, what happened was um, some friends of hers were killed in a fire that occurred across the street from her home. So while she didn't experience the trauma per se firsthand, she experienced the trauma of losing a close friend. And she was a child when this, when this all occurred. So, you know, a family member may not think that was necessarily a big, a big incident for her mom or may not even know about it. Um, but as it turned out, that, that was a very significant trigger for this, for this resident. So anything that's traumatic for that individual is, could be considered a trauma. So we really kind of need to look at a more holistic, more um, wide approach when we look at traumas and what could be a trauma for one person versus another person and, and so on. Um, events such as historical events, like we just talked about the 9-11, uh, natural disasters, whether it's flooding, tornado, hurricane, um, or any personal events. Um, and we'll be talking about a little bit more of that here in just a minute. Um, because we all kind of, kind of think of some personal events as automatically being traumatic, you know, um, dealing with domestic violence, um, a divorce could be, could be a trauma. Um, whether it's, whether it's the parents getting divorced or the child enduring going through divorces themselves. Um, so when we're looking at traumas and talking about traumas, um, we really need to kind of set the bar really low in, in, in what we're considering traumas um, because it may be a, been a very traumatic event for that individual and we, it wouldn't have been for us, but it would be for them. So we need to really kind of look at, look at it with, a, um, with our rose colored glasses off basically. So what is vicarious trauma? and who can experience it? Um, if you could put your answers in the chat again. Anyone experiencing trauma through others? Anyone can, everyone. Uh, EMS workers, anyone can experience it. Secondhand trauma, anyone. Yeah, and those, those are all correct answers. Um, basically, anybody can experience vicarious trauma. Um, it's more common, um, as some people mentioned in the chat, um, certain fields. Um, or more prone to experience vicarious trauma than others. Um, but literally anybody can really experience it. Um, it's a type of trauma that's experienced indirectly through another person's traumatic event or story. Um, you know, vicarious trauma is generally experienced by those individuals who work directly with victims. 
Um, however, anyone who is exposed to another person's traumatic event or story can be affected. In long-term care, this would include not only the staff, but other residents as well. Um, you know, whether it's the roommate, you know, they see something occur at the, at the facility, you know, that vicarious trauma, basically it is you're not directly involved, but you're still affected by that traumatic event is what basically that boils down to. Um, and it's something else to be aware of too. I'm, I know um, in reading some of the traumatic events that some of our residents have endured and whatnot, it can be very easy to kind of self, um, self, um, self experience yourself kind of vicariously as, as well. And it's something just to be aware of um, that you don't, you know, internalize some of that trauma um, and whatnot and cause a tra traumatic event for yourself. The other flip side of this is through vicarious trauma, it could trigger you. Um, if, you've, if you've gone through a very similar traumatic event, it could trigger your, your trauma response. So being aware of that as well is very important. Um, and again, what's traumatic for one person may not be traumatic for another person. Uh, so just being aware of that and kind of taking each, each moment or each opportunity you have to talk with, your, with the individual kind of with empathy and understanding and trying to, you know, if they're willing to talk about it, talk about it, but if they're not willing to talk about it, you know, that, that's the way it's going to be. And in those situations, you just kind of have to put on your um, thinking cap and think outside the box when you're looking for triggers. And we're going to talk about that here again in, a, in just a little bit. So how do we identify what's a trigger for a resident? Well, what, I, what I recommend is really a, what I call a holistic approach. Um, it requires thinking outside the box and really kind of examining different situations and, and examining, examining them with a really what I call an open eye, that you're really kind of looking at all possibilities. Um, so identifying the traumatic event, you know, some things are simple or obvious and others are not. Um, you know, obvious triggers would include sight, sound, some less obvious, of course, smell or time of day. And with a holistic approach, we look at all aspects surrounding the traumatic event. What could be causing the trigger and the memory of the traumatic event? In the example earlier, we used that picture of that clock. And it's not necessarily the clock that was the trigger, but the time represented on the clock. You know, if someone was abused at the same time of day, such as a child when their parent got home from work, then that time of day could be a potential trigger for that individual. Um, I can give an example, uh, a real life example of where uh, time of day became a trigger for, for a resident. Um, every afternoon about three o'clock, um, there was a resident in a facility and every day at three o'clock, she, she was labeled as exit seeking because every day at three o'clock, she tried to go out the front door or any door that was available. And she got labeled as exit seeking three o'clock. Of course, first thing they thought was sundowners. And so she ended up with the three o'clock sundowners exit seeking labels. Um, and this continued for quite a while until one day, um, one of the staff were like, you know what, let's, let's see where she, where she wants to go. You know, they always would keep her from going outside. And so they were like, you know, Let's go with her. Um, you know, if we go with her, it's not, she's not eloping because we're with her, you know? And so they did that. And when they went outside, she went out into the parking lot and then the, they heard the train whistle. And up to that point, they never asked the resident, why are you trying to leave? Where are you going? All that kind of stuff. Cause they're afraid that would just, you know, impact the situation and cause it to be worse. And so while they were outside and they heard the train whistle there, uh, they asked the resident, you know, why, why were you trying, wait, were you, what are you trying to do? You know, why were you trying to leave and come outside here? And she said, because my kids are getting off the bus. Someone needs to get the kids off the bus. And what it had occurred was with this resident at three o'clock every day, it's when her kids, well, during the week, 
is when her kids would get off the bus from school. Also, three o'clock every day, a train went through town and she heard the train whistles. So for her, she was getting the time of day and then the auditory, she could hear the train whistles and stuff. And she knew, oh God, I, I gotta go get the kids. We never did find out if there was a traumatic event tied to that where she missed her kids one time or anything of that nature. She was just concerned that she was gonna miss her kids getting off the bus. So how did, how did they deal with with the situation because it wasn't going to go away now they knew what what it was that was going to you know miraculously not not affect her anymore and telling her you know your your kids are older or anything like that would just not have worked so what they did is about three o'clock or right before she would start her exit seeking is they would approach the resident you know and let her know that so and so was going to go down and get your get the kids off the bus how about if we uh, stay here and create a snack for them or, or do this for them and whatnot and kind of keep her occupied. And that worked. That that was the one simple thing that they could do. And it worked every day. Um, it's not, I'm surprised it worked every day, but it did. And that's one of those things where they kind of thought outside the box. Once they identified what the triggers were, and it wasn't just the time of day per se, it was that train whistle and stuff. Now they knew the triggers, they couldn't stop the train from coming through town. There just wasn't any way to do it. And yeah, they probably could turn up music or whatever, but again, that's not going to serve a real good purpose there. So what they did, it, rather than uh, try to remove the triggers, is they tried to address her response to the trigger. And that response was to reassure her someone was getting her kids, which is what she was worried about, and that they would help her get something ready for the kids while, while she was, stayed with them. And that worked. So when we're looking at triggers, we really need to kind of look at the environment, look at what, what happened, what, what occurred. You know, like I said, we never did find out if there was a traumatic event associated with her not getting her kids off the bus. We never did figure that out. But we knew there was a trigger and they, they knew that, that they needed to address it. Um, just be aware though, if you decide to look, when your residents go outside to see where they're going, you may be going for a hike. Um, we actually had this occur in, again with another resident. And for her, it wasn't a time of day, it was sunny weather. Whenever there was sunny weather, she wanted to be outside and she was exit seeking all the time. Again, she got, got that label again. And finally, someone noticed it only occurred on sunny days. This, didn't, this behavior did not occur on rainy days or anything like that. But on sunny days, she was constantly trying to get outside or at least exit, at least from what they could tell. And it wasn't until they talked to the family that they found out she was a stay-at-home mom who had a, a flower garden and a vegetable garden that she tended to every day. And if the weather was nice, she was outside. Now, of course, you can't have a resin outside all day long for obvious reasons, uh, not to mention sunburn and all that kind of stuff. But the way the facility addressed this situation was, again, she didn't have the lab label of exit seeking anymore because she wasn't exit seeking to leave. She was exit seeking just to be outside. And so what the facility did is anytime someone went outside to do anything, you know, go to the supply shed, you know, water the garden, whatever the case may be, that they asked that resident if she wanted to go along. Nine times out of 10, she did. And so she would accompany that, the staff outside and the exit seeking or that behavior will say stop because she was getting outside. Now, gra granted it was intermittent and sometimes intermittent reinforcement as you all know is sometimes the best kind of reinforcement. Um, but she stopped the constant trying to get outside um, because she was getting outside. She was getting out in the sun. She was able to look at the flowers. Uh, the facility actually ended up planting planting a vegetable garden. So she went out there and helped them with that. Um, but again, it was seen as a quote unquote behavior and whatnot. And for her, the trigger was a sunny day. Um, so another way we can, we can try to identify triggers um, is through a technique called ABC documentation. And ABC documentation Documentation stands for antecedent, what occurred before the quote unquote behavior. And this could be the potential trigger, the behavior of the incident, and then the consequence. And not, not talking punishment, but what happened after the behavior. 
what caused the behavior to stop or what was, was the potential uh, trigger removed. And so if we document these incidents in such a way, observing what, you know, documenting exactly what happened right before the incident um, and what happened afterwards, what kind of work to get it to stop. Was it redirection? Was it they were offered something to drink, something to eat, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, those are the types of things. Um, if you document it that way, it's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take, you know, a couple documentations or months of documentations to really kind of look at the documentation and see, do we have a common antecedent? Do we have a common consequence? You know, is there something that, that we're looking at here that that could be causing causing the, this issue for this resident? Or is there something, you know, that's being removed that, that seems to end the, end the behavior, end the incident? And so when we look at, at behaviors this way, um, and it doesn't work for all behaviors, it only works for behaviors that are triggered or um, triggered by, um, uh, event or something else, or if it's, you know, has a consequence where it tr truly gets stopped because something else was done. But if you document that your the behaviors incidents in such a way, you can then go back through and look for, for commonalities and see if you can figure out, you know, what's going on with this or what's going on with that. Um, again, I can give you an example, um, had a resident uh, for the longest time, no incidents, no issues, no nothing. Got a new roommate, um, and then the agitation started. But it, it wasn't every day. It wasn't constant. And so they start documenting in, 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 in this ABC documentation strategy way. And what they came to find out, it seemed like every time his roommate's wife showed up to visit the roommate, that, that's when he was agitated. And so the, the initial thought was, well, maybe she's done something to him or, you know, and they looked at that, no, that, that, that's not going on. So that can't be it. But it only occurred when she showed up. And it wasn't until his family showed up and the roommate's uh, wife showed up that they were able to figure out what was going on. As it turns out, the other roommate's wife looked like the, the first resident's ex-wife who he hated with a passion. And so he was under the impression that it was, that was his ex-wife now visiting the guy next door and, and would become agitated. So to fix this issue, both residents agreed to change rooms. And then the behavior basically stopped because he wasn't seeing the roommate's wife anymore and thinking it was his ex-wife. Um, but again, they couldn't figure that one out right away because it, once they figured out it was only when the, what, the one resident's wife visited, visited they kind of got stumped because it was like, okay, well, maybe she's done something and it wasn't that at all. It was just the fact that she looked like somebody else. Um, so those are the types of things. And when I talk about thinking outside the box and thinking holistically, that's what I'm talking about. We really kind of have to look at all possibilities and kind of dig when we can to find out you know, what the commonality is. And like I said, it wasn't until both families visited on the same day and the one family commented to staff, God, she looks like dad's ex-wife. That's when they put two and two together and kind of figured out maybe that's what's going on. And it, as it turned out, that's exactly what was going on. Um, next month, you're going to hear a presentation from another group of individuals, and they're going to be giving you some really great examples of triggers and how to address those triggers and, and whatnot. So I won't go into any greater detail, um, but that is something coming next month. So another approach that we can use is what I like to call a timeline approach. Um, I, um, my background besides working um, with seniors is also working with um, the IDD population or the intellectual disabilities population. And one thing they do in that, genre uh, work area is when they do a social history, they do a full social history from birth th through present. 
And what I found that was extremely helpful, helpful with that was the fact that it really encompassed a lot of life events that could have occurred or could have been traumas. And so in looking at trauma and trauma-informed care, um, it just seemed like a natural fit to look at um, things in a timeline perspective. Um, and the one thing about, about using this perspective or this approach is that you can cross-reference over different topics. Um, we talked about historical events. We've touched on natural disasters, personal events, or ones that are just personal to that individual, such as a marriage, divorce, um, those types of things. Um, and so what, what we can do with the timeline approach is actually put those events on a timeline and then look to see if there's anything commonality wise with what we're seeing that could be a, a trigger or not a trigger. Um, all these trauma informed care approaches are meant to be fluid. Um, it's not that you're gonna sit down, fill out an assessment and, and there you go and have all the triggers, have all the traumas and you're good to go. This may take a good while to do. It may even take years truly to do because um, you, you may not see a trigger per se until it's triggered. So if something's not triggered, you may not never see it until it is. And that could be a years down the road. So it really is, is something that, that really needs to be um, kind of fluid. And as you gather information, things are added to, um, whether it's just a timeline or it may be care plan, depending on the severity of the trigger and what, what's going on. Um, and also being conscious of where your information is coming from. Um, for those of you that work in nursing homes, who spends a lot of time with your residents? I bet you'd be, if, I, if you could, could talk, you'd say, you know, maybe housekeeping. And that's true. Housekeep, your housekeepers spend a lot of time with your residents when they're cleaning the rooms, if the resident's still in the room. You know, they may be chit-chatting as they're cleaning and stuff, and they may get information, but they don't know it's important or where to, who to tell, you know. Through their, their chit-chats, it may come out that, you know, a resident's experienced this or a resident's experienced that. Um, and you, the information's there, it's just you don't have it. So, you know, when you think of gathering the information, really you're gathering it from the resident, the family, your staff who may have talked to the resident or family, any number of different uh, loca locations can come to this information. And so gathering this information from all these different sources is really important. Um, but a timeline approach allows you to at least to somehow organize it in a way um, that kind of makes a logical sense, if you will. I'm a visual person. So for me, it, it, it was an obvious, an obvious choice. Um, Again, though, too, as, as people with dementia or Alzheimer's, they kind of go backwards in time. And so using a timeline approach kind of gives you an idea of maybe where they're at in that aspect as well. Um, so using this timeline approach um, can be very beneficial. Like I said, it, it's, it's meant to be fluid. It's meant to be added, things added to it. Uh, of course, you can remove things as well. Um, and this is basically, um, an approach that I kind of developed after doing some research and trying to figure out how's the best way to document trauma. You know, it's one thing to have a, a note somewhere, um, but if no one ever reads that note or does know that note exists or were to look for that note, um, then it doesn't serve the purpose. Where this timeline is something that could be um, easily um, referenced and added to and, and whatnot too. Also, another thing about this timeline approach, it gives you more background information on your, on, on your residents. Um, I tell this story often about a resident I visited one time and I got to the nursing home and I asked where the resident was and they pointed him out. He was in his room and the staff told me he's not gonna talk to you. He didn't talk to anybody. And I'm like, okay, um, what can you tell me about this resident? And some of you may have heard the story before. I tell it often. Um, and they said, well, he was a farmer, cattle farmer. I said, okay. And so I went into, into, into his room, introduced myself. And the next thing I did is I, 
I apologize for my parents. Um, and the reason I apologize for my parents is I had scratches all up and down my arms. And I said, I'm sorry, I you know, need to apologize for my parents. I looked like I was in a cat fight or something, but I was helping my wife's family put up hay and they didn't tell the city boy not to wear short sleeves and shorts. And so I got all scratched up from the hay. That's all it took. Once he found out there was that commonality, we talked about his farm. We talked about my, my wife's family's farm a little bit. And then we were able to talk about, um, you know, what the reason I was there to talk to him about. Um, and I'll never forget this as I walked out of the room, the staff were like, how did you do that? How did you get him to talk to you? I said, I just found something we had in common. And it may not be something obvious that you have in common. It's all about building a rapport with your, with your residents. Um, and that's, you know, so this information that you're getting, you can use to build a rapport with your residents as well. It's more than just, you know, just the trauma aspect of it too. You can gain information that may be beneficial to kind of get someone to come out of their shell or just find a commonality that you guys can chit chat about and then kind of delve into what you need to talk about. Um, I do this all the time with, with residents, you know, and, and maybe, and maybe something I know ahead of time, or maybe a clue that I get from the, when I enter the room, or maybe just general conversation. Um, I found sometimes that that's the best way to do it. Um, but all this information that you get and it, having your timeline, it can serve other purposes as well. There's more than just the trauma aspect of that as well. So you're probably thinking, okay, well, what's one of these timelines look like? And so this is the, the um, design that I had come up with. And um, so as you, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's very easy to add, subtract to, change. Um, and so down the left column there, the very first column is the years. And to me, that made the most sense to do it by year. Um, the next column is historic events. Um, so I listed historic events that I thought may, may, may cause trauma or may have caused trauma just to give a starting off point. Um, that's the only purpose of, of putting that historic trauma in there um, to have an idea of what might have occurred during that resident's lifetime that may or may not have affected that individual. And again, you can add things to that column. There, I didn't go into great detail, as you can see. I mean, I just list the highlights, but there could be many other things that come up and you can add those in. The next column is your uh, natural disasters. And if you can't tell by my accent or lack thereof, I'm not originally from West Virginia. Um, I married my wife, she's from West Virginia. And so I'm from Pennsylvania. So I actually had to do some research on natural disasters in West Virginia. And I wasn't able to find a whole lot, which may be a good thing. Um, but again, things can be added or removed as they apply or don't apply to that individual or resident. The middle column there, that one is um, personal events. And when I say personal events, I'm not just talking traumatic events. In this personal events column, I recommend listing things such as, um, of course, the resident's birth, the, you know, the year they're born, um, and then any, any kind of event, life events that have occurred. Um, for those of you who have Facebook, you, you know how you can list your life events on there. Those are the types of things, you know, so we're talking, you know, birth of a child, marriage, which I said, you know, I'm talking about graduating high school, you know, if they were in the war or enlisted or, you know, um, death of a parent, death of a child, divorce, you know, all those types of things. Those are the personal events I'm talking about for that column. <clears throat> The next column is trauma. So what trauma did the individual experience because of those events, whether it's natural history or nat historical, natural, or the personal event? And you would list that in, that in that column. And the very last column is triggers. This is where you would list your triggers for that trauma. And you may find that you have triggers that carry over from multiple traumas. Um, and that's the other thing too. Um, we're not lucky as human beings to only experience one trauma and be done with it. Oh, I had my trauma, I'm done. I don't need to have any more. I, I wish it worked that way and it's, it doesn't. 
unfortunately, we've all experienced multiple traumas. With that mindset and with, with saying that, multiple triggers can come from multiple traumas. And they can be the same trigger, but diff from different traumas, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's something else to be aware of, you know. Um, you know, once we know the trigger, addressing the trigger is what we want. We were wanting to do, you know, and may not be the trauma we're thinking of, it may be a totally different trauma. Um, so in that last common column, you would list the, the potential triggers or things that you think are triggers, things that you know are triggers, um, whatever the case may be, that's what gets listed in that last column. And I'm, I know you're probably all thinking, all right, how do I put this into action? How do I actually utilize this? And so what I've done is I created a fictitious, a fictitious resident um, and gave him some trauma, gave him some information and put it in into one of these forms or spreadsheets. So you can actually see, and these are the two handouts that Susan will be sending to y'all is um, a blank copy of this Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Well, it'll have, this pre-stuff done already in it, but, um, and then you'll actually get the example one as well. And so here's the, the sample resident that I chose, um, a fictitious resident, I should say. Um, again, um, I put the year that he was born, um, and then I listed his personal events. I didn't add any, any of the historic or natural, I just went with what was already there. But for him, um, I entered the personal events and you know, he lived through the tornado in Shinston. He was drafted into the war Vietnam War at age 18, uh, got exposed to Agent Orange, discharged from Vietnam from the war, he got married, bought his first home, whoops, um, had his first had his first child, um, got divorced, and then his mother passed away. So those were the personal events that I listed. And then which of those personal events or which of the historic or natural events caused this individual trauma or were traumatic to this individual? Um, for him living through um, the tornado at a young age was traumatic for him. Um, being drafted into the war that he didn't believe in and saw horrors of the war and exposed to Agent Orange that was traumatic for him. And he noticed here that this um, box or cell, if you will, goes over multiple years. And that was the other thing. Um, another reason I chose Excel to do this is because oftentimes traumas don't happen just one year and that's it. Um, you know, oftentimes traumas are reoccurring um, and whatnot. So I wanted a way that you could act easily put that in, in here. Um, another example might be a victim of domestic violence, maybe a victim of domestic violence for the whole entire time they're in that relationship. So that may be over multiple years. Um, he also had an uncle die in, in the mining disaster that happened in Farmington, West Virginia. Um, he got divorced um, and by his wife for another man. And then he is very close to his mother. And when he, she died, he went into a deep depression. So once I had the traumas, then I need to look for the triggers. What were the, what would, what were the triggers that caused this resident to relive these traumas? And for this resident, um, we go back up to the top, tornado warnings, news about tornadoes um, were his triggers. Um, as far as, um, the Vietnam War, so war movies and news about the war were triggers for him, sounds of gunfire, um, also maybe fireworks, maybe a trigger, um, people of Asian descent uh, would be a could be a possible trigger. And down here um, for his mother, Mother's Day was a trigger for him. Um, not her birthday, not the day she passed, Mother's Day, I'm remembering the times he spent with his mother.
Did we freeze? Um, a lot of times what we see in those instances is um, when people talk about PTSD and triggers and stuff, they all seem to say the same thing are triggers for, for all veterans. And that's not the case. That's not true for every veteran. Um, you know, we're, we're not, you know, cookie cutter and kneeler veterans. Um, I can tell you, you know, firsthand from my brother-in-law, he has, you know, has has triggers, has PTSD, but he loves war movies, you know, and that those don't seem to bother him. He enjoys those. So for him, he doesn't fit that mold. Um, now, gunfire. individual information at face value and utilize it that way that we don't uh, automatically assume well there's this this nest therefore the triggers must be this this and this it doesn't work that way um so for for him for this resident you know maybe not having um war movies playing in the lounge area you know or you know Fourth of July, you know, if you're going to have fireworks at the nursing home, maybe you have something else for those who don't like fireworks or can't tolerate fireworks and make it so that they can't hear the fireworks. Um, so those are the types of things that, that you really need to look at for Mother's Day for this present. I know most nursing homes have a great hoopla on Mother's Day for a very good reason. What are we going to do differently? How are we, how are we going to take away that trigger for this for that individual? You know, coming coming up with different events or things for him and some other people who maybe do don't like Mother's Day, don't celebrate Mother's Day for whatever reason. You know, those types of things. So making sure that kind of all the bases are covered, um, that you're really not just you know serving the masses, but you're, we're serving individuals, and that's why it's person centered care in the first place. And so we can individualize our care and treatment. And it's not just med passes and that kind of treatment. We're talking treatment as, as a holistic view of things, including activities, including all different all the different areas. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I can uh, give you an example of a, a natural disaster with myself actually. And I didn't realize this was a trigger for myself. Um, I had gone through some counseling um, and we had talked about traumatic events and whatnot. Um, and as it turns out, I now know why whenever there's flood warnings or if there's heavy torrential rains or whatever, I kind of get on edge and antsy. And I had forgotten about this, but when I was, um, age three, believe it or not, uh, we actually had to evacuate our family home due to our town being flooded. And that was Hurricane Agnes there in 1972. So I'm giving away my age. Um, but I was three years old and I, and I remember leaving in the middle of the night. I remember the water in the streets and never, it never dawned to me that was a traumatic reason, traumatic trigger or whatever you want to call it, event uh, for myself. But I always knew whenever it, there was call for flood warnings or there was a lot of torrential rain, I really got antsy and got anxiety and, and was worried about stuff. And it wasn't until I went through that. So, you know, here I am 53, you know, 50 years later, I'm 53 now. So 50 years later, realizing, oh, okay, that's a trigger for me. Now I'm aware of it. Now, when I experience those things, I'm aware of my trigger. And so I'm able to work with myself to, you know, relieve the anxiety and know that that's what the response is. It has nothing to do with all the other stuff. And just, you know, that first experience, my first memory as a child. So, um, and the very last thing, I wanna stop my presentation because I wanna show you the, the, the whole spreadsheet because right now you're only seeing part of it. So, uh, how do I stop sharing? Oh, there it is, the big red button. 
Okay, let me minimize this. Oh. Okay, so. And now we're going to do this again. Maybe. And share screen. And this is what I want to share. Okay. So this is that spreadsheet I was I was just showing you. This is the actual spreadsheet itself, and it's bigger, so you probably read it. Um, I apologize for the, how small it was in the presentation, um, but as you can see, um, I continued adding the information over here. So you can, when you when you receive this, if you ch choose to utilize this or something like this you literally can continue adding information to it, you know, um, because you know, the other thing is once someone gets to a nursing home, that doesn't mean they don't have trauma anymore. It just means the traumas look, you know, you're experiencing trauma in your facility now, not necessarily, um, you know, prior to coming to you. Um, and I'm pretty sure we, we all can agree that the COVID-19 pandemic, this whole pandemic thing has been traumatic for everybody. And I know it's been traumatic for the residents, especially, especially that first year with no visitors and or visits through the windows and those types of things. Um, I know that was traumatic and hard for the residents. And so that's definitely something that you're gonna to wanna to be conscious of too going forward is if any residents or your new residents who may have come from other facilities who may have handled it totally differently than the, what, what your facility handled it, to be aware of those types of things. Um, but I wanted to be able to show you all the whole picture. So any questions? I know I threw a lot at you and I took more time than I thought it was gonna take. Thank you, Ed. And as always, my friend, you are a rock star. What great information you shared. And as Ed said, I'll be sharing his PowerPoint presentation and the two handouts or the Excel spreadsheets that he showed. When hang with me a second so when I sign off, you can get the link for the evaluation. And again, in May, we'll do our fourth in the series of the Wednesday webinars. And it will be talking about social histories, how to do care plans, and how to continue developing those with the triggers that we discover in our residents as we get to know them better and better. Anything else, Suzanne? Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon, and you will be getting an email with your certificates and the other information as mentioned, as well as a link to register for next month's webinar. Thanks so much.